we know our new unit is on electricity. In that context, in the context of electricity, what do you see up on the board? What is that? Yeah? It's what? Yeah, well, kind of. It's, 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 it's what we often visualize the atom is. It's not really our current model of the atom, actually. If you've taken chemistry, you know that we have what's called the electron cloud model of the atom, the quantum mechanical model of the atom, which is... Um, which, is, which doesn't look like this exactly, but we often represent it this way because it's a little bit easier to see. In the end, if we represent it this way, we can see clearly that we have something that orbits around the atom. What is that something right here that orbits around the atom? Yep. Yeah, it's an electron. And what's the charge of an electron? Yeah, it's negative. What is it that's in the middle of the atom here. This is kind of drawn out of proportion. We know for about 100 years almost that um, this thing that's in the middle of the atom is really, really, really small compared to the rest of the atom. Most of the atom ends up being empty space. We've drawn it a little bit bigger than we probably we should have, but need to be able to see it. What is that thing called? This small, heavy thing in the middle of this atom. It's the nucleus. And what can... What makes up the nucleus? What's inside the nucleus? Two things. Protons. Yeah. Inside the nucleus are the protons, and the protons are what charge? Positive or negative? What is it? Positive, right. Protons are positive. And the other thing that we have inside the nucleus is the... The other thing that we have inside the nucleus is the neutron, and the charge of a neutron is? Yeah. It's neutral. Now, uh, we know that electrons are fundamental particles. It doesn't get any smaller than, than, than electrons. Uh, but we know now that protons and neutrons, although they make up the atom, and we think of them often as fundamental particles, they're not, actually. Protons and neutrons are made up of much smaller particles called quarks. And we'll talk about those in a lot more detail in our final unit. The reason we're not going to talk about those now is because this unit focuses on electrons. It's the electrons that orbit around the nucleus that we're dealing with in this unit. Whenever there's an interaction between two things, it's going to be electrons that are interacting. These electrons are bound to the nucleus by what's called an electric force, an electrostatic force. Um, positive attracts negative. The nucleus is positive. The electrons are negative. They attract each other. But that force can be broken, and therefore things can happen to these electrons that provide us with these electrical interactions. All right. So we know that positive charge is, or sorry, we know that protons are positively charged. But where does positive charge come from? If we have a, let's say, a balloon that we rub against our hair and the balloon becomes positively charged, um, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that the balloon is just made up of protons. It's made up of protons and electrons. But if it's positively charged, it means that it has... Sorry? Yeah, it means it has more protons than electrons. We'll deal with exactly why it has more protons than electrons in a moment here. But for now, let's just say that if it's positively charged, it has more protons than electrons. It doesn't say anything about the number of neutrons. In fact, we won't even touch a neutron for the rest of this unit. Back, or when we go to our final unit of atomic physics, the nature of matter, we call it, uh, we study neutrons a fair little bit. They become really important because we're studying interactions within the nucleus. But for electricity, it's, it's not relevant. Okay? The neutron doesn't really matter. Usually there's going to be a few more protons, sorry, neutrons than protons, but it doesn't really matter for our purposes here. What about negative charge? Again, we're not talking about um, just electrons. Everything has protons, and almost everything at least has protons and electrons. But if it's negatively charged, then, yep. If it's negatively charged, then it has, yep. Yeah, it has more electrons and protons. Or you could say that it has less protons than electrons. And finally, if it's neutral, it doesn't mean that it has no protons and no electrons. It simply means that it has an equal number of protons and electrons.
we're going to learn in a few minutes how you make something positively charged, right? We know it's positive if it has more protons than electrons. Well, how do you make it have more protons than electrons? It's negative if it has more electrons than protons. Well, how do you make it have more electrons than protons? And we'll deal with that in just a few moments here. So how do we describe charge? Well, the unit of charge is called the Coulomb, named after a guy named Charles Augustine de Coulomb. Just like the unit for speed is meters per second, or the unit for energy is joules, the unit for charge is a Coulomb. The symbol for speed is V. The symbol for energy is E. The symbol for charge is a lowercase q. So we would say the, number, the amount of charge is Q is equal to blank coulombs. Now, we don't have a, an intuitive notion as to how much a coulomb is, whereas we do have an intuitive notion as to how much a kilometer per hour or meters per second for speed is, right? If I said a car is going down the road at 75 kilometers per hour, you would, you would at some level be able to picture that car traveling down the road and know how fast it was going, know how fast to picture it, right? If I said um, somebody was running at 10 meters per second. You might not have a perfect notion as to how fast that person is running, but you would have some kind of idea. Is it reasonable that a person is running at 10 meters per second? But a coulomb, it's completely outside, for most of us at least, outside of our realm of experience, so we have no notion as to how big a coulomb really is, unlike a meter per second or a kilometer per hour. How big is a coulomb? Well, it's really big. It's really big. One electron has a charge of negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, which means it would take approximately this many electrons to make up one coulomb of charge. It takes a lot of electrons to give us a coulomb. Right? That means a coulomb must be a really, really, really big unit of charge. About 10 to the 19 electrons to make a coulomb of charge. What about the charge of a proton? If you take chemistry, you probably know this. You might not have studied the exact value in coulombs, but you know that the charge of a proton is the same as the charge of an electron. So if an electron is negative 1.6, then a proton would be positive 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. It would therefore take about 10 to the 19 protons to make a coulomb of charge as well. This is such a big unit of charge that we often don't see it listed as a coulomb. Rather, we often see nc, or a nanocoulomb. That's 10 to the minus 9 coulombs. We often see it written as a mu c, a microcoulomb, which is 10 to the minus 6 coulombs. We still have to remember to convert it to our standard units, which is the coulomb but we often see it written as microcoulombs or nanocoulombs just because a coulomb is such a big unit of charge. I'd like you to pull out your data sheet for a second and take a look at it. Mark it up. Where do you see the charge of, a, of an electron and a proton on this data sheet? Where do we see it? If you take a look at the right-hand side of the page, it lists all these different particles, alpha particles, electrons, protons, neutrons, and then these things that they call first-generation fermions that we'll talk about in our final unit. Focus on these four up here right now, the alpha particle, the electron, the proton, the neutron. Right beside that, they list the charge and the mass of each of these things. The mass is given to us in kilograms in standard units already, but the charge isn't. The charge of an electron, it says, is negative 1e. The charge of a proton is positive 1e. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, if you look on the left-hand side of our data sheet, we see the elementary charge. We'll talk about the elementary charge in our final unit as well and where that comes from. But the bottom line is an elementary charge, e, is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Therefore, an electron has a charge of negative 1 times the elementary charge or negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. A proton would be positive 1 times the elementary charge or positive 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. An alpha particle, as much as we don't even know what an alpha particle is yet, an alpha particle would be 2 times the elementary charge or 3.2 times 10 to the minus 19. Realistically, by the end of the year, you're probably going to remember the charge of an electron because we're going to use it so often. But if you don't, 
you know where to find it. Just remember that it's kind of a two-stepper to find it. All right, look on the right-hand side, minus 1e, and then we know that that's minus 1 of the elementary charge that appears on the left-hand side. You got it? All right, sometimes we see uh, ions. You guys know what an ion is? These are ions. Do you know what an ion is? In chemistry, you know what an ion is, right? If you don't take chemistry, even if you've just taken science 10, which all of you have, you might remember what an ion is. Tell me what an ion is. It's not an atom, but it's close. It, it, yeah, it's, it's charged. It's, we'll call it a charged atom. It's an atom that's gained electrons or lost electrons, leaving it with a net charge. This is aluminum, an aluminum ion. It has a charge of 3 plus. If we ever see this notation in the context of an ion or anything else, we know that the, the 3 plus means that it has a charge of 3 times the elementary charge, or we would say 4.8 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. This would be positive because it's 3 plus. This, on the other hand, O2 minus, the charge would be a negative 2 times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, which gives us negative 3.2 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And finally, if we see Na plus, I don't even see a number there. What does that mean? If it just says plus, you have to assume plus 1. Yeah, plus 1. So we would just say that this one would be the elementary charge or positive 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. We don't see that a ton, this notation, a ton in this unit. It does, we don't even see it a ton really throughout the year, but it does arise uh, a little bit later on. This is a good time to tell you what it is because you now know what an elementary charge is. Let's have a quick little look at one example. It's going to go pretty quickly for us. Just um, quantifies the charge of an electron for us. This one says a balloon is rubbed against hair and it gains a charge of negative 9.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Don't worry about how it gains that charge right now. Just trust me that it gains this charge. It was neutral, now it's not. How did it gain it? We'll learn that, uh, we'll learn that mostly tomorrow. But we want to know in this question, though, how many electrons the balloon has gained or lost. Tell me right now, before we do any calculation to determine a number of electrons, tell me whether it's electrons that have been gained or lost. How do you know? Yeah, it's become negative, so it must have more electrons than protons, therefore it must have gained electrons. If it lost electrons, it would have more protons than the electrons. How many is it? How do we determine the number of electrons here? Let me give you an analogy here. If you go to a Safeway and you buy a bag, a bag of oranges, they're in a paper bag, so you can't tell how many, how many oranges are in the bag. But you weigh one orange, and each orange weighs 200 grams. You weigh the bag of oranges, and it weighs 1.2 kilograms, or 1,200 grams. How many oranges do you have in the bag? Each orange weighs 200 grams. The total bag of oranges weighs 1,200 grams. How many oranges in the bag? Yeah, how'd you figure that out? How'd you figure that out? It, it's, not, it's not a trick question, okay? How do you figure out how many oranges in the bag when we have a mass of 1,200 grams and a mass of one orange of 200 grams? Yeah? Yeah, we divide it. We divide out the total mass by the mass of one orange. Whenever you want to find a number of something in physics 30, the number of oranges, or the number of electrons, or the number of photons, whatever the heck a photon is, we'll learn about that later on, you're going to divide the total of something by the amount for one. In this case, when you're trying to find the number of electrons, you're going to divide the total charge by the charge for one electron. And the total charge that's given to us here is negative 9.6 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs. The charge of one electron, check back to your data sheet if you don't remember, is negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. When we divide those two numbers, let's see what we end up getting here. Uh, negative 9.6 times 10 to the minus 9 divided by negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 gives us 6 times 10 to the 10.
when you're finding the number of photons, two units from now, you're going to say the total energy divided by the energy of one photon. The number of oranges, the total mass divided by the mass of one orange. It's always going to be, though, when you're looking for a number of something, the total something divided by the amount for one. I've put that note on the back wall there. You can see on my always list back here, you see F versus F and T, impulse. F versus T graph, area equals impulse. Always think that, right? When we see a collision or an explosion, we always do conservation of momentum. When we want to find a number of something, we want to divide, you can see here, it says AT divided by A1. Anything total divided by anything one. Mass total divided by mass of one. Charge total divided by charge of one. Energy total divided by energy of one. Whatever you have, you take the total amount and divide it by the amount for one. Right? That makes sense? And of course, we know that this were, these were electrons gained because it was a negative charge here rather than a positive charge. All right. Back to our... Back to our picture of the atom for a second here. This middle thing was the nucleus again, and that consisted of protons, which are positive, and neutrons, which are neutral. These things orbiting around the nucleus, it's not quite as clear as we have it drawn here. They orbit around in clouds, okay, these mysterious clouds as, as waves. But we have to draw it somehow so that we can see these electrons. So we draw it this way. These electrons that orbit around, if something's going to move, like if something's going to move, if we're going to have an interaction, and this is really what we're talking about in this unit, is, is the interaction between things here. It's going to be the electrons. Can anybody suggest to me why it's going to be the electrons? Why when, why when this balloon was rubbed against the hair, was it the electrons that were transferred rather than the protons or the neutrons that were transferred. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. The electrons are held in, in orbit by a force called the electric or the electrostatic force. And that's an attractive force. You guys know that positive attracts negative, right? The nucleus is positive. The electrons are negative. The electrons are attracted to the nucleus by an electric force. Kind of like, kind of like uh, the planets are attracted to the sun as they orbit around the sun by a force of gravity. They're held in orbit there. But the protons and neutrons have to be held together as well. There's a force inside the nucleus that's attractive that keeps these things all together. It's called the strong nuclear force. Sometimes we abbreviate it here. Let me write this so you can actually read it. It's called the strong nuclear force. And sometimes we abbreviate it by calling it the SN force, the strong nuclear force or the SN force. But there's that force that keeps the electron in orbit around the nucleus as well, and that's called the electric force or the electrostatic force. The electric force, although it's an attractive force, isn't as big as that strong nuclear force. So normally, normally in this context at least, the electrostatic force loses when energy is put into something. If you rub a balloon against the hair, there's kinetic energy pumped into it. That kinetic energy goes into something. Well, it's not going to go into causing the protons to leave and go somewhere else because they're too tightly bound to each other. Rather, that kinetic energy goes into separating the electron from the nucleus. It goes into breaking the bonds of electric force versus breaking the bonds of the strong nuclear force. So if something's going to move, it's going to be the electrons. Now, that's not to say that the strong nuclear force can't ever lose. It's not to say that the protons can't ever leave or split up from an atom. That can happen. But that's not an electrical interaction, then. That's a nuclear reaction. And that's a whole different ballgame. That doesn't happen by rubbing a balloon against your hair. You don't get a nuclear explosion when you rub your comb through your hair or jump on the trampoline or rub that balloon against your hair. It can happen, but not in those circumstances. Let's define a couple of, uh, a couple of terms here that relate to the movement of electrons. Now, the first one is a conductor. The second one is an insulator. You've heard these terms before, right? A conductor is 
I don't like that color. Let's change it to, let's change it to yellow. That's better. What's a conductor? In the context of electricity, right? You've learned about conducting conduction in the context of heat, but you've also learned about in the context of electricity. What's a conductor? Think back to grade nine. Uh, transfers energy, kind of. Yeah, you're not wrong. You're not necessarily thinking of it the right way, but in the end, energy is transfer, yes. Yes, and that was a good example of a conductor, actually. Let's not use the word energy in there, though, okay? Let's say it's something that transfers electrons, and the electrons carry energy with them. So by that rationale, then they transfer energy as well. But let's, let's think of it as the transfer of electrons, a material in which electrons uh, can be transferred. Why can they be transferred? Because they're not as tightly bound to the nucleus. A material in which the outermost regions of the atom are free to move. Now, what general category of materials has the outermost regions of the atom with the electrons that are fairly free to move. You kind of said it earlier. What is it? Metals, yeah. Generally, we have metals that are conductors, generally. Versus insulators, plastic, wood, paper, insulate rubber, their materials so which the electrons aren't as tightly bound to the nucleus and therefore are not as free to move around within the substance. Listen, it doesn't mean just because you have an insulator that you can't conduct electricity with an insulator. There's no, it, it's not like you have a category of something that conducts electricity and then this category doesn't conduct at all. Conductors just conduct electricity better. The electrons can leave in any atom just easier in conductors. We've had a miserable month of weather. We've had a lot of snow in the last month, and we've had a lot of cold in the last month. Even in those uh, snowstorms that we've had, I don't believe that we've seen any lightning. It is possible to get lightning in a snowstorm, but it's very, very unlikely to get lightning in a snowstorm. But yet, when it rains in the summertime, we see lightning all the time. Why are we more likely to see lightning when it rains than when it snows? Yep. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Uh, no, that's a good guess, but that's not that's not a guess. Yep. Yeah, in the summertime, when it rains, the air is more humid. In the wintertime, the air tends to be very, very dry, right? Well, if you have a certain buildup of electrons on a cloud up in the sky, or a certain buildup of protons on a cloud up in the sky, you can get lightning going both ways, from the cloud to the ground or from the ground to the cloud. You have a certain buildup of charge on the cloud. Lightning wants to strike. Lightning, electrons want to jump from the cloud to the ground or from the ground to the cloud. But they're more likely to do it when there's a good conductor that acts between them. Moist air is a much better conductor than dry air. Therefore, it's more likely to strike, given the exact same cloud in the exact same ground, it's a lot more likely to strike when it's damp air, because that air is a good conductor, versus dry air, because that's not a good conductor. It doesn't make it impossible. It just makes it harder when you have a good insulator than when you have a good conductor. Does that make sense? You could, have, you could have a wire that's wrapped in an in insulating coating. Normally, you can touch that wire. Well, if there's too much current going through that wire, you couldn't touch it, and it was too thin of insulation, you couldn't touch it because it would still transfer electrons through it. Not just as, just not as easily, that's all. Okay, don't copy this down. This is just a... This is just a picture that uh, shows us a comparison of different materials and how well things conduct and how poorly things conduct. You can see the top group here are our conductors. And this top group, relative to the bottom group, has a really high degree of conductivity. You can see silver has a conductivity of about 10 to the 8, relative to rubber, which has a conductivity of about 10 to the minus 15. In other words, silver is 10 to the 23 times better of a conductor than rubber is. But that doesn't mean rubber can't conduct. If you stand outside in a lightning storm with a golf club in your hand, 
you might get struck by lightning, despite the fact that the soles of your shoe are probably made of rubber. Electrons will transfer through that rubber. They'll transfer a lot better through the golf club than they will the rubber, but they'll still do it, right? So you can see that these top ones have conductivities that are all 10 to the positive something, and these bottom ones have conductivities that are 10 to the minus something. These are conductors, and these down here are insulators. They'll conduct, but just not nearly as well as the conductors will. And what do you notice about those conductors? They're metals, yeah. And what do you notice about the, the insulators? Wood, glass, rubber? They're not conductors. Or sorry, they're not metals, right? Wood, glass, rubber, um, all, all non-conductors. Or sorry, all uh, non-metals. Okay. Three laws of electric charge, and then I think we might just wrap it up for the day in terms of new material. Three laws of electric charge that might take you back, that should take you back to Science 9, although you might not remember these. You'll recognize them. In no particular order, just the order that I thought of them when I was typing out these notes, we say that opposite charges are going to do what to each other? In other words, if you have positive and negative, they're going to do what? They're going to attract each other. It means they're going to be pulled together. Oftentimes, when people are opposites, they're attracted to one another. When charges are opposites, they're attracted to one another. A lot of times when you have two people that are too similar, too much alike, they drive each other crazy, and they're repelled by each other. Like charges repel each other, just like people that are too much alike repel each other as well. Two people that are too much alike get to the point where sometimes they push each other apart. They push each other away. They repel, or they push each other away. Not unlike two protons or two electrons. And finally, the last one, charged objects attract neutral objects. I'm going to highlight a word here. Objects. That's an important word. Protons do not attract neutrons, not electrically. They do by that strong nuclear force that we were talking about a few minutes ago, but not electrically. Electrons do not attract neutrons electrically. Electrons attract protons, but not neutrons. Charge doesn't attract neutral. Charge attracts a neutral object. So you can have a neutron, it's not attracted to anything electrically, but you can have a neutral balloon and it's attracted to something that's positive or negative. Tomorrow, you're going to learn why that's the case, why it needs to be a neutral object versus just a neutral thing, a neutral particle. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that can be positive or negative, absolutely. Whoops. But remember that positive or negative, and it could be something as, we really, we don't need the object word in there. It could be something as simple as a proton or an electron. A, something that's charged will attract, not something that's neutral, something that's charged will attract something that's neutral if it's a neutral object. It has both protons and neutrons present in it. Sorry, protons and electrons present in it.